So attribution theory is a major aspect of social psychology, and it really has to do with these distinctions between the self and other people, how you judge and attribute and explain other people's behavior relative to your own behavior. And so again, there's this really strong desire and need to construct a consistent uh, self model and, and a consistent picture of what's going on. And you apply that same kind of logic to try to understand what other people are doing. But as we saw, you're not actually always able to really incorporate what, what other people's real perspective is and you map others onto the self, but often in imperfect ways. And so this all plays out in really interesting ways in the context of this attribution theory. So the basic idea is with an attribution is simply, you know, what from a kind of causal perspective do you attribute people's behavior to? How do you explain other people's behavior? And there's two kinds of factors that people have looked at. One is kind of dispositional factors, something about the person themselves versus situational factors. And this kind of notion of the difference between the self, the disposition, the, the internal factors of a person versus, you know, the situation, the social context, all the other environmental factors that are going on, again, is this fundamental tension and distinction that we see throughout the, the, the field here. So the fundamental attribution error, very widely uh, discussed and known phenomenon that uh, is also somewhat hard to replicate, it turns out, especially cross-culturally, uh, but nevertheless is very compelling, is this idea that we uh, tend to attribute other people's behavior to these dispositional factors. We look at somebody else, we see them behaving, and we kind of think, oh, well, they're doing that because that's who they are, right? And furthermore, we tend to uh, ignore the situational factors that are influencing their behavior, okay? And that's because it's easier to kind of focus and, and have our attention focused on that individual and understand what they're doing as a person. And it's harder to see kind of these situational factors that might be influencing what's going on and causing their behavior. And the other kind of really important aspect of this is this crossover situation when we think about our own behavior relative to how we interpret other people's behavior. And this is the actor observer bias. And it's a little bit tricky to kind of think about what is the difference between the fundamental, fundamental attribution error and actor observer bias. So the fundamental attribution error is one half of the actor observer bias, right? So when we look at somebody else behaving, we attribute their behavior to their own kind of dispositional factors. Whereas when we look at our own behavior, that flips. So we are actually able to interpret our own behavior uh, at least in, in certain situations as uh, being derived from situational factors. And especially this applies to negative behavior. So there's there's a lot more going on here. There's, there's the valence of the behavior, whether it's negative or positive. Um, and so in particular, the classic example is uh, when people are uh, observing bad driving, right? Uh, versus you yourself are exhibiting bad driving. So if you cut somebody off, uh, and you're going fast and you're kind of in a hurry, you know, oh yeah, it's really important because you know I, I, I really have to get to this meeting that I'm late for. And if I don't get there, I'm gonna lose my job, right? Some, some really important thing. I'm on my way to the hospital. You know, some, some really important situational variable is causing you to behave that way. But of course, when somebody else sees you, you know, and you see somebody else driving crazy, you think that person is just a jerk, right? You don't understand that there might be factors that are causing them to behave that way. And so that is the actor observer bias. It's just that basic attribution, bad behavior on the part of another person is because they're a bad person. Bad behavior on the part of you is because, oh, uh, the situation made me do it. I'm, I'm just responding to these perfectly reasonable uh, demands of the situation. There's a larger picture about all this attribution, which has to do with this, this picture of cognitive dissonance, which derives directly from this notion of the self model. And this, in this context, it applies specifically to our own internal understanding. Uh, and again, we're much more concerned about creating a consistent understanding of our own behavior than we are about others. And so cognitive dissonance is this effect when, when your own behavior is at odds with you know, what you think of as your normal kind of belief, values, or attitudes, right? What you think, who you think you are, your dispositional 
kind of characteristics. And you, if you have that dissonance, that discrepancy, you behave in a way that isn't consistent with who you are, uh, you have this kind of, you have this discomfort, right? It's, it's a crack in your, in your internal model of yourself. And so you, to fix that, you have several different options. One is, you know, you could change your attitudes to match your behavior. So you could say, oh, well, yeah, in fact, I guess that's, that is who I am. I am kind of a jerk. I do kind of drive crazy. Uh, you could change your behavior to match your attitudes. So you could say, next time I'm going to be more careful. Um, or you can change your perception of the mismatch. Oh, well, Maybe that wasn't such a big difference after all. Maybe that is consistent. The, the key point is that we don't just sort of like ignore these discrepancies, even though we have a lot of inconsistent beliefs in our minds. Uh, we, we do care about kind of reconciling these things and trying to make sense of why we behave in, in certain ways. And so it turns out that we often uh, sort of rationalize our behavior in the context of these cognitive dissonance phenomena rather than actually change our behavior itself. And that is because changing behavior itself is actually quite difficult. <laughs> so we'll look at that in a second. So an example here, uh, you eat a cookie, uh, even though you're on a diet and you're like, okay, uh, let's see, I'm gonna minimize the distance, uh, the dis discrepancy there by saying, oh, I just, I just had one cookie, what's one cookie? It doesn't really matter, it's consistent with my beliefs, because I could have eaten a lot more and I only had one, so therefore I'm actually being good. Um, or you can justify it. You can say, well, you know, I worked really hard today, so I deserve that extra cookie. Uh, you know, all, all different ways of trying to make sense of your behavior. Uh, whereas, you know, you're probably just being impulsive and, and you know, cookies taste good and yeah, your body <laughs> wants to eat that damn cookie. So, um, you know, this is this is the kind of overall phenomenology of cognitive dissonance, trying to make sense of, of how how we're behaving and, and come up with a consistent internal model. And so this segues right into this problem that most of us have with struggling with self-control. We, we, we want to have these ideal kind of images of ourselves, these idealized behaviors and values. And then, you know, sometimes we uh, really have a hard time controlling. If we're gambling, we can't stop one more hand, I know I'm gonna win next time, that kind of feeling. Uh, one more drink, if you're drinking and you're, you know you lose control with alcohol, et cetera. So one of the most important studies in this, in this domain is the marshmallow study by Walter Michelle. And in this case, they gave kids, you know, typically like four or five year old kids, um, a marshmallow on a plate. And they said, look, if you don't eat this marshmallow and you can wait for 20 minutes, which is kind of a long time, uh, then you get two marshmallows, okay? And so uh, they looked at individual differences in these kids about whether they decided to have the one marshmallow or wait for the two marshmallows. And this is a phenomenon known as intertemporal choice, and it really comes up everywhere. Um, in fact, so many decisions and so much of self-control is really about like, you know, do you want to get some kind of benefit now or some larger benefit later? Health Later is going to make you live longer, but you know, eating something tasty right now is obviously immediately satisfying. So that trade-off between satisfying your immediate desires and wants versus kind of thinking about longer-term future outcomes, that's really the, the main uh, trade-off and struggle here. So Michelle found that kids who did happen to put off eating the one marshmallow had a lot of uh, good outcomes later in life. Uh, and more recent research has shown that this is actually not really so much of a strong individual difference factor, but it also has a lot of influence from social factors as well. And, you know, and many of us have had these experiences where we're sort of, you know, sitting down with a, a bag of popcorn or something and sitting, especially sitting in front of the TV and you're just like, well, is that gone already? Gee. Um, so just having this ability to regulate your behavior in healthy ways, self-control, you know, amounts to this ability to control these desires, these impulses, and, and try to maintain some longer term, uh, higher level, uh, values and self-regulation is the particular, uh, construct of all the different kind of processes and monitoring and controlling that go along in trying to maintain your goals. Overall notion of self-control involves uh, prefrontal cortex executive function, um, this ability to maintain your overall long-term goals and 
and you know have that executive top-down signal saying, hey, look, this is what we need to be doing. This is what's important. Don't don't go for those short-term benefits. Think about these long-term things. Um, and so this this notion of self-control really ties up with this executive function, uh, higher level uh, ability to behave according to motivated goals, et cetera. And so this really ties into all those same constructs that we were talking about in the thinking and the motivation chapters, et cetera. And again, the, the dominant force here is really intertemporal choice. Should you, should you live in the moment or save for the future? And really you see this trade-off in different cultures and different people and, and everybody has different kind of uh, weightings and values on those set points.